Jonathan, and we are live. All right. Well, Mr. Dave, good to meet you. How are you? Doing well, doing well, Nick. Hey, so good to be with you, man. Thanks for inviting me on. And yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation with you. Yeah, it sounds good. Um, I, I definitely, there's a couple things that, um, you know, my brother kind of mentioned, you know, the garden. Yeah. Garden was one thing. He was like, you got to ask him about the garden. Um, <laughs> But you're, you're, um, are you, are you now, I know the well has a lot of different, um, like campuses and stuff like that. Explain to yeah. us a little bit, you're in, in the Madera area. Um, yeah. how, how does that kind of work? What are you doing over there? Just to kind of start us off. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can, let me tell the story yeah. of, of, uh, speaking of us being in Madera, the story of how I know you. Okay. Um, and so right now I'm, I'm sitting in the office of a home that your brother built, <laughs> nice. so, uh, which is awesome, as you know, but I, I think it's really fun. You know, uh, my wife and I just got to move into kind of a new development here in Madeira, um, like two weeks into shelter in place. And oh, wow. so uh, we really uh, were like right across from the office where the salesmen hang out and we like became really good friends with the salesmen. Okay. Uh, they're just awesome dudes and so my son and I would take like he loved taking fruit snacks over to Tom over here one of the salesmen and through that I uh, started talking to your brother quite a bit as I don't know his official title is he project manager or construction manager um I don't know he yeah. he's, he was been he's been in the industry for a long long time yeah. and um I, I know he kind of got out of a way bigger position to kind of take yeah. something closer to home Yep. Um, but I, I actually don't know what his like title. Yeah, I don't know his official <laughs> title either. But uh, I know that he oversaw uh, the building of our home. So our final walkthroughs before we moved in um, was walking through with Jason and just noticing things. He walked us through how everything works, and so he and I would just stand out in the driveway and talk. And so that's when he said, "Hey, my my brother is doing this podcast called Influencers Podcast." Would you be willing to jump on? I was like, sure, heck yeah. Nice. Uh, so anyway, it's kind of a fun, fun connection. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about the garden when you want to. But, <laughs> um, to, get, to get back to your, to your question, so um, right out of college, um, my, my wife and I met at Fresno Pacific. Okay. We got married um, right out of college. And then I started a seminary internship with The Well in Fresno. And so um, I knew that I wanted to pursue uh, my master's and go to seminary and, and potentially become a pastor. And the well was just introducing for the first time this track of bringing on about three or four interns where they paid for all of our seminary tuition. And uh, we got mentored along the way for three years. And then the plan was to launch us out wherever the Lord kind of put on our heart to plant a church with kind of the well brand or well DNA kind sure. of infused in it and I was actually only a couple months into this internship when um some couples out here in Madeira um you know just 30 30 minutes north of Fresno here on the 99 about a couple a few couples were traveling into the well Fresno on Sundays but they were hosting a life group here in Madeira during the week and that life group just grew and grew and grew to where they finally had to replicate so the one life group became three life groups those three life groups filled up and so they approached the the well and the leadership there and said hey could we start a campus here and at yeah. that time the kind of the well to kind of answer your campus question the well's uh kind of philosophy at that point was any well that we have in fresno will be a campus anything okay. outside of fresno will be a church plant and basically the, the difference was a centralized model versus a church planning network. So they said, we want somebody in Fresno to walk in on our North campus, our FIG campus, and at that time, I think a Southeast campus, and it should feel the exact same, no okay. matter where they walk in, in in a well Fresno. So it's campus, it's centralized model. Anything outside of that, if you're a well church planner, go do whatever you want, which okay. I was really thankful for. So we kind of had more autonomy. Yeah. Um, they basically say, hey, you know your context. Madeira is different than Fresno. 
the well, you can still kind of have the well feel and all that, but you know it's got to be a bit different to fit your, your culture, your context. So that's kind of, that's where we find ourselves. Okay. Um, because, yeah, I, I've uh, connected with a, a couple of different people, and they just happen to be uh, from the well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and different connections. Um, it wasn't even well people referring well people. Yeah, it, yeah. it was it's kind of cool. Um, I have never kind of, I, I was born and raised in Porterville, which is yeah. not too far. Yeah, but I yeah. moved, moved here and I've been in like active ministry, church planning um, this whole time. And for the first time, my brother moved into town. Yeah. And for the, kind of the first time, I was looking for a fellowship. Mm -hmm. And Jason was looking for a fellowship as well. And, um, you know, we, we visited, I think we together went and visited one and I visited another one, but it was just kind of like, man, this is a, it, it can, and talking to other people, it could be a tedious process. Yeah. Like, there's there's got to be, I was looking online, like, um, you know, let me hear, hear these pastors talk at least. Mm -hmm. so, you know, people have different personalities. Like you said, Madeira is different than Fresno. Yeah. Um, so that kind of sparked the idea was like, man, let me just start um, kind of creating a, what do they, they call the old days? They had those uh, Rolodexes, right? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you know, like a video Rolodex of these churches, these ministries. Um, that way people, I mean, I've made so many connections already for people. Um, it's just kind of hard to know what everybody's doing. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. That's kind of what got me going with this. So. That's cool. Cause I, as one of the questions I had for you is, is I love hearing the idea of, or kind of the backstory of how an idea came about. And so is that what kind of began to formulate this thought of, of you starting this podcast and kind of trying um, to connect, make the connections? To, to be honest, I, I was looking back on some of the messages that I sent out. It, it was probably like, um, eight years ago when I first wanted to do this. Wow. Um, yeah. I, I've been making videos and, and doing kind of, uh, I had a, a kind of a larger church presence online at one point, um, yeah, yeah. you know, having, you know, more than 10,000 people view like a service on Sunday morning remotely all over the place. Um, yeah. And so I've always kind of been in that media world and, and loved it. And I, 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 my kids laugh because I, I think I have like 12 YouTube channels out there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, this was honestly kind of just a thought for, for many, many years. And I, I went different directions. And then it was um, recently with uh, my brother coming into town. I was kind of like, man, it, it's really difficult to, yeah. you know, grab you. You know, we have an hour here. Um, right. But you can't give an hour to thousands and thousands of people. Right. So how can I help? What kind of a service can I provide for these ministries and, and mm -hmm. pastors? Um, I can document kind of a chit chat, get to know you over coffee conversation. That way everyone can kind of sit yeah. in and get to know that other person. So I was like, man, I was trying to talk to my brother into doing it with me. And, and yeah. finally I was just like, man, I gotta, let's just go. Let's do it. Yeah. So um, this is kind of the first first idea connected to it um i i want to expand it i want to create a show the next thing that i'm going to create is a show called perspective mm. um where i find people who are willing who have the time to jump on maybe once a week and talk about um cultural you know things that are happening in the news yeah. but kind of bring a godly perspective in it. yeah I, i'm i can't stand hearing the news talk about, oh, I, I hate Trump and I hate right. Biden. And like, where's God's heart in, in this yeah. stuff? And so I definitely, that's kind of the next project here is to um, start doing that maybe once a month, once a week and, and try to bring a God's heart perspective into yeah. these times. Because you turn on the news, man, it's, it's, it's just hate and fear and, and craziness right now. Yeah, yeah, I tell you what, I love, uh, if I can just encourage you to go for it, create that 13th YouTube channel and, <laughs> and do it because 
Um, I'll tell you I'm what. Gonna, I'm gonna honestly, I'm gonna run it off of this one. I'm gonna keep. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> we'll keep it at twelve. Oh, it's biblical. Um, no, I I, I want to encourage you, Nick. Go for it, man. That is needed more than ever. That's I've shared with our leadership team and some in our church. That's actually one of my prayers through COVID nineteen. Yeah. Is uh like I'm I'm kind of trying to keep an eye out for like what are things that only God could do through a pandemic like oh what are things that only God could do through a, a very kind of scary uncertain kind of reset time that this feels like for our, our world and our nation and one of the kind of like kind of silly but interesting prayers I've been praying is I hope people become so tired of misinformation. I hope that people get so tired of the lies and the twisting and the deceit and the manipulation that they're thirsty for truth. Yeah. That people say, somebody tell me the truth. Like, I yes. need somebody I can trust. Yeah. And that's why I believe that those of us who hold to the truth of God's word get to come swooping in and say, this is what we base our lives on. You want truth. Let's give you truth. I've been telling him, you know, one of my favorite Proverbs talks about how anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And I think of the anxiety, the worry, the pressure, the uncertainty that everybody's feeling right now in the world. And I think as Christians, we have this incredible privilege to deliver that good word that makes a heart glad, that gives yes. a person hope. And so I say that all to say, Dude, go go for the perspective channel. People yeah. need it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's um, you know, doing ministry. It was always um, a big thing that I wanted people to learn. Was it's in Matthew? It's kind of the Matthew principle of going to your brother when there's a misunderstanding yeah. or a, you know, there's a whole process. Yeah, of finding... everybody's favorite passage, by the way. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, everyone loves that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's basically, to me, it says, hold on a second here. Mm -hmm. Let's figure out what, what's even going on, like in the news, like yeah. we were talking about. Um, you know, like we have this last, these last couple of instances, and we won't get into it because that'll take our whole time. But, you know, right, right. what actually happened? Like, instead of yeah. just jumping in and, 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 and being hateful for this or that or both sides, and I want to have both sides. I want to have, you know, maybe left-leaning yeah. Christians and rightly, I want to, if we can't come together and have some sort of loving conversation, we're in trouble. Um, yeah. But I, I want to cultivate that and help us to hear each other and, and do that. So uh, I think you've got, a, you've got a gold mine thought there, especially at a time like this. And I mean, I even, I think you, your topics could be endless, right? I even oh, yeah. think of um, I was sharing with a, a buddy at the the gym like last year, it was over a year ago. Who he's a he's a science major, has a real love for for science, and we we're just striking up the conversation. I'm real big on trying to help people see that it's not faith versus science; it's faith yeah. and science. It's God is the creator of science. So the more we, with integrity, look at science and the beauty of it, and we discover new things, it makes us. It, it actually strengthens our faith. It doesn't attack our faith. And that was the first time he'd ever heard that. He'd ever heard a Christian say something like that. It's like, dude, like, and, and I, I said, you know, what bothers me is, you know, there's this whole creation versus evolution debate and everybody gets all weird about how old the earth is and all that stuff. And I'm so, I'm so thirsty for a true, genuine scientist who can say, here's the data we see. Yeah, because I, I really have no idea when somebody starts talking about how old this bone is or they know <laughs> this rock is this old. I'm like, I have no idea if you're telling me the truth or not. Yeah. I mean, somebody tell me the truth, yes. you know, yeah. I want to know. I, I believe that God created all of this, but I would love to have a better idea of the timeline of all of it. But I can't I don't know who to trust, you know, exactly. It, it's yeah. really difficult. Yeah. So anyway. Um, may the odds be ever in your favor. <laughs> it, well, like you said, I mean, it, it, every week there seems there can easily be another topic. I mean, I could probably yeah. do a show every day at some point. Um, I don't know if yeah. it'll get, get to that, but um, I just, I, I, my, my heart's passion is that all of us brothers and sisters are able to actually have a conversation. I'm, I was talking to Dave Baker and he has a phrase that says, um, disagree well. 
Like, what does that look mm -hmm. like? How can we disagree well in love? Yeah. And so I, I, was, I always go to him. He's got always these good, good phrases that I like to pick up. Um, but cool. yeah, like I said, we could talk about this forever and maybe we can kind yeah. of, uh, you can steer some people my way and stuff or, or whatever. Yeah. It'll, it'll be fun to kind of explore that. Um, my, yeah. my question real quick for you is explain yeah. your hat. What's going on? I, I can't. <laughs> what is going on with this thing? Um, so I, I used to play a lot of baseball back in the day and, um, then my, my buddy of mine who, um, so I haven't played baseball since college and haven't really done anything with it for about eight, eight years or so. Uh, but uh, my buddy, who's also part of our church, is the high school baseball coach here in Madera at Madera High. Um, and uh, so the Madera Coyotes. coyotes. And uh, he's been trying to talk me into it for a couple of years to come help him coach. But I'm in this season of life as a husband, as a yeah. dad with some young ones and a pastor. I'm like, I got to be faithful to these things on my plate here. I so want to help coach. So he actually came up with a compromise. It was a brilliant idea. And I, I jumped on it. He said, well, what if we brought you in once a week to just do leadership talks with these, these high school boys and what it means to be a good teammate, a good leader. And he lets me talk about Jesus, which I'm all about, you know, until yeah. I get in trouble. And, uh, and basically just, just love on these high school boys and say, hey, I'm a pastor. Uh, I know some of you have a really, really difficult situations at home. Um, and you may not have somebody you trust you can talk to. Here's my phone number. I'll buy you. I'll buy you a frap and let's talk, you know. So that's been a good blend. Uh, well, until COVID-19 <laughs> hit and the baseball season was canceled. Uh, so long story short i got some free gear and i wear it <laughs> okay. yeah because I, I didn't recognize it but i mean it looks yeah. good so. yeah i like it it's yeah it's rent it's not their colors at all but i think um once a year they do some sort of like fundraiser game or something like that where they turn their their uh, logo into a camo hat and yeah. wear camo uniforms you know like some of the mlb teams will do something like that so it's like i'll i'll wear it why not Sounds good. Um, so you, you mentioned um, going to college here. Are, were you, are you originally from this area? Where were you born and raised? Yeah, so uh, I was born in a little known town called Ripon, Ripon, California. Okay. Yeah, so up Heard of it. slightly north of Modesto on the, off the 99. Okay. And then when I was three, I don't remember any of that, but yeah. when I was three, um, we moved up to Mariposa. So. Huh. Uh, my my parents kind of had a difficult situation, and they were separated uh, and divorced when I was one. Mm -hmm. And so my mom actually uh, kind of got out of a tough situation and moved us up. I could tell a long story, but I'll keep it short and sweet here. Oh, you good? Up to Mariposa, a small mountain town up near Yosemite National Park. Um, yep. And so, uh, to to this is where it gets weird. I use, so Nick, this I trust you. Okay. I usually have a rule. I don't tell people this until I know them for at least like two it's, years. It's just me and you here, buddy. <laughs> until until your world audience is watching, right? Uh, and uh, but anyway, we moved up to Mariposa to yeah. actually start uh, and run an ostrich ranch. Okay. And so yeah. My grandpa, my mom's dad at the time, was a manager of a cotton gin and fireball and an entrepreneur, loved trying new things. So he knew, hey, his daughter was now a single mom trying to raise four boys on her own, right? Yeah. Single mom, four boys. I'm the youngest of the four. Uh, we're, we're dirt poor. And he said, here's the deal. I want to start an ostrich ranch. I bought 32 acres up in Mariposa. You and the boys run it, and that'll be your living. And so uh, I spent some of my, my early years helping raise ostriches up in a 32-acre ranch in Mariposa. <laughs> so like That's I said, awesome. I, I typically don't, don't just throw that out there until I could trust my <laughs> – <laughs> but I trust you. So good luck. Awesome, man. Have fun with it. What? No, that, that's, that's fascinating. I mean, I've never yeah. met anybody that actually, like, worked with ostriches. <laughs> right. um, like, how many are we talking about here? Yeah, so um, we had, uh, I want to say at the time, uh, about 30, I think it was about 30 adult ostriches. And um, 
and what we would do, and this is where it gets crazy, and I was pretty young at the time, but my older brothers would basically r run into the ostrich pens um, yeah. and grab the egg from the nest. And then we would put the nest um, in incubators and it would keep the production going, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, what we do is we would either sell fertile eggs to other farmers, and that was a big part of the business, or then as a young kid, if they hatched, then I would raise up the, the little ostrich chicks. So we had a lot of uh, young ones that we were either selling off or, or letting grow up, but only about 30 or 40 adults to kind of keep the production going. So yeah, it's pretty crazy stories. We had one of our fellow ostrich farmers in Mariposa, he had actually an old school Hummer okay. and he, uh, his way of like harvesting the ostrich eggs was he cut a hole in his floorboard and he would drive over the nest, just lean over, pick up the egg and put it on his passenger seat. <laughs> Meanwhile, the mama bird is just kicking the heck out of yeah. his Hummer. So he would roll into our ranch and he had dents all over his Hummer and stuff. Uh, but uh, we, we didn't, we couldn't afford that. So we, uh, we actually would, um, you know, some of us brothers job was to distract the ostrich the other side of the pen while the other brother ran in, grabbed the egg, tucked it like a football. Around. <laughs> so that was our, that was our childhood, man. So you guys yeah. got your uh, speed, huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Did that, um, now is that something that, that went on for a long time? Is that still going on or what happened with the farm? It was kind of a short period. Like I said, my grandpa loved to try stuff. Um, and um, he, he ended up passing away actually on our ranch. He, uh, he was, we had to pull out a lot of manzanita bush um, to try to create room and, and develop these ostrich pens. And so we would throw a chain around manzanita bushes and yank them out with our tractor. One day, um, I was about seven years old. I think his foot must have slipped off the clutch or something and the tractor flipped on him and up crushing him and killing him. So he died on a ranch and that kind of just, as you can imagine, just kind of took the, the air, the wind out of the sails. And, yeah. and at that time, the ostrich business had a very short like spike of life where yeah. when we were first in it to sell a fertile ostrich egg, you would sell one for about a thousand bucks. I mean, it was valuable. Yeah. Uh, by the time within five, six years, we were getting out of the business, it was down to about 50 bucks. So oh, it, wow. had, it, it, it had done one of these, right? Yeah. Like got popular. And the reason is, is people, um, people were really getting into like the health of the ostrich burgers and ostrich meat because it's really high in protein, low in cholesterol, but it had no chance, you know, against the beef industry, right? So it was kind of like a short dream, you know? Gotcha. <laughs> Interesting. So, so so yeah, it was it was just a bit kind of a blip of our life for sure. Uh, did you guys um, stay up in Mariposa or did you move after that? We did. So when I was about eight, we moved to a stayed in Mariposa, but moved to a new property about ten acres, and um, we were just really really grateful to land a, a beautiful property um, with uh, with a pond. So I grew up with a pond and all kinds of fishing and swimming and. Uh, as brothers, we just played hours and hours of, of baseball and basketball. So we would, we would uh, tape up those old school wiffle ball, wiffle ball bats with duct tape and then use tennis balls. So it was like between wiffle ball and full out baseball and we would just play for hours uh, out there. So yeah, good memories. Thankful for where we grew up for sure. Yeah. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. no. Mariposa, did you go to um, any of the little country churches up there? Was it a Christian household at this time? Yeah, so a little bit of everything. Uh, for years, we did like home churches. Um, and so, yeah, we did kind of that experience, which I have a lot of good memories from that of like, and in many ways now as a pastor, I found myself wanting to gravitate back towards that untraditional home church feel where Matter of fact, actually, we're going to kind of be morphing towards that a little bit right now, considering the restrictions. Yes. Uh, um, my wife and I are going to be inviting people for Saturday, which, by the way, come hang out uh, Saturday nights uh, in September. We're just going to open up our backyard and bring your own lawn chair, space accordingly. We're just going to read the Bible together, talk about it. We're going to sing uh, songs by request. I'm asking our worship leaders, just come ready to play any song that people ask for. Uh, we're going to pray together and we're going to do communion. So we're going to do our best to just kind of be Acts 2 type church where 
you know, there's, there's no performance. There's nothing really said or ready. We just read the word, talk about it, celebrate the life, death, resurrection of Jesus and um, sing together. It's going to be all relationship and centered around the word. So I find myself kind of like, like always trying to chop down and cut away like unnecessary tradition, like the the separation between like staff and church members, like it, First should always be participation. I think that comes from my roots of yeah. home church. You know, just like you show up and you're ready to give just as much as you're ready to take. And that's what yeah. it means to the church. So, yeah. How How old are your kids right now? Uh, three. Got a three year old boy, Finn, and then oh. a one year old girl, Tessa. So Finn and Tessa. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you mentioned the home churches. Um, some of my favorite, I mean, I, that's all I did when my kids were, were little. I mean, we were in church every day somewhere, you know, yeah. just helping. Um, and, and just, we went into, a, it was like Lindsay area up in the hills. Yeah. Nice house. Mm-hmm. Um, but for years, we went there every Thursday night and all the little kids would all, you know, we'd have dinner together before. All the kids would sit together. It was so yeah. it was cute. There's 20 little kids sitting together, mm-hmm. um, just running around, playing. You know, the adults would start like a worship service and then, you know, get into whatever. But it's just, and a lot of us would spend the night at the house and the kids would all, you know, be in a room and we'd wake up and have breakfast in the morning together. And so yeah. it's, it's addicting, man. That, that whole, it whole is. stuff, it always pulls at you. It does. And I think, you know, when we talk about kind of a reset and what God might be doing to kind of wake us up to some things is just been asking our leadership team, what are some things that we could shake and kind of restart and reshape? And I think that's one of them is to go back to church centered around relationship, not consumerism, right? Like, I think the church in America for decades has fallen in the trap of like, we have to produce a really good product. So we get people to come and stay. Yeah. Preaching has to be good. Our worship set has to be good. Our coffee has to be good. And, and those are good things. Like we want to be good hosts. Right. So there's sure. something to that, but there is also something to be in like, I need you to be here just as much as you need me to be here. That's what church should be. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. So, so you've got, you've got a couple kids. I have five. Five. Wow. Uh, How old are they now? uh, They're all teenagers now. Oh, man. What's the teenager? What's teenager stage like? It's awesome. Yeah. Every, 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 um, I always say, um, to anybody who who ever asks, I always, my, uh, kid's mom, I've I've been divorced with her for like 10 years, but we've been very close. We, for years and years, we would do, um, uh, vacations together and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I always talk about, I always wanted to write a book about what does a godly divorce look like? Yeah. Um, but yeah. so, you know, over the years, so um, it really, I, I, I always say this and I believe it, that if you want to train your children to be fun to be around, pleasant to be around, and you can do it. They're so smart. It, yeah. I, I'm, I'm tempted to not say this, but I, it's what I say. So I'll say it. But if you can train a dog to be, <laughs> you, can, you can train your kids and yeah. uh, it takes time. It takes, um, you have to be consistent because once they realize that, oh, dad isn't going to get up and come deal with this, yeah. it, you're gone. But if, you know, we spent a lot of time with the first one, the oldest, we had yeah. five, less than five years. So they're Whoa. very Yeah, I was going to say, if they're all teenagers right now with yeah. five, you have them yeah. close. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, I wanted to be able to teach them, and, and I wanted her to be able to go to the store with no problem. They would walk in a line like little ducks, and, you yeah. know, they're, it was hilarious to watch them. But, you know, it, it started when they first started to crawl. We would teach them not to cross the line into the kitchen at, at uh-huh. that point. But you had, it was a lot of teaching, a lot of time, you yeah. know, a lot of people, you know, with just like anything that they're not willing to put that time in. Yeah. But if you do it with the first one, it's, it's almost like a culture thing. You mm. create this culture. And then by the time you get to the couple of 
the last ones, they're like, oh, this is what we do around here. We pick up our toys. Yeah. We don't make messes. If we make a mess, we clean it up. I mean, just little stuff. Yeah. Um, but it, it can be done. And they're just a pleasure to be around. Um, you know, they're not perfect angels yeah. all the time. But we don't have problems. We don't, you know, yeah. they. you teach them how to, you know, value each other's hearts and, and yeah. you know, be aware of how they can be hurtful. All that stuff. Yeah. Just take just takes time. Wow. Uh, but are they all doing online school right now? They've been homeschooled their whole life. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Yeah. This is, um, this is just normal for them. Um, yeah. True. Really not that big of a deal for them at all. Um, yeah. You know, other than they go to a church, they go to the First Baptist Church of Clovis. Um, okay. And so that kind of changed. They didn't. It, it, being homeschooled, you have to really the effort in the being around different social wise yeah. uh, but i kind of i always took them with me to different ministries like home ho uh, homeless ministry or wherever yeah. and so they got to see different cultures different people and and so they're really i i, I love them to death they're my kids but um yeah. just they're a lot of fun to be around um and that's they're, cool they're thinkers you have conversations though but every stage is amazing uh, don't believe the, the horrible twos or whatever. I, we have wonderful twos. Um, it's yeah. just, you know, what, think outside the box. What is God's heart in this situation? And so um, That's good. it's, it's a, I, I definitely encourage everyone to, to enjoy, enjoy their kids, let them be a blessing and stuff. So that's good. What would you say maybe for us with a three-year-old, one-year-old, like what are what are you mentioned training right and i i like that train if you can train a dog you can train a kid uh, if you can dodge a wrench you can dodge a ball um yeah. if what are like a couple things you would say these are essentials to train them in when we're looking at a, a three-year-old a one-year-old here what are some things you would start kind of ingraining in them so so that's kind of the the first thing is for their safety a lot of it is yeah. you know trying to keep these kids alive um, <laughs> that's very true right? yeah we, we never um like child proofed our house um I, i'm not yeah. saying i'm not saying not to do that right but um we would just teach them you know you, you yeah. get like it's take an outlet uh electric outlet you know um you know you you as soon as they start to understand they can understand a lot more than you think mm -hmm. they, they understand like pain or a little you know yeah so I would always get close to the electric outlet and kind of pretend I was going to touch it and just like, ah, you know, <laughs> like you're starting to communicate with them. Um, yeah. But anytime they go by there, you can kind of, we always did like a three step. I think you have to be very kind of legalistic until they can understand communication into the heart. Yeah. So, if they would touch something they weren't supposed to, the first thing I would kind of take their hand and go, no, no, yeah, just like that. If they did it again, I would do it a little harder. Yeah. You know, no, no, don't touch that. And the yeah. third time, third time would be the hardest, but not like hitting them Yeah. Um, to where it would hurt. Like that's the yeah. only, that's almost the only thing they can understand at that time. Yeah, yeah. And there's other ways to do it if you're not comfortable with that. But after that, I would take them away from the situation. That's, that's as far as we would go. Yeah. They would kind of, oh, okay. It would register. And then they might go back, depending on your kid's personality. They're all yeah, that's true. But if they go back, this is what I mean by the consistency thing is you yeah. got to be willing to no, no. Mm -hmm. And then they, they start putting it together. And you'd be surprised. We had little kids. I, like I said, five little kids, we never had to worry about where they were in the house. What were they touching? Were they picking stuff up? They weren't, no, we, we didn't, Yeah. we just didn't, but we spent that time. I put that time in a lot as a father. I yeah. didn't come, I didn't come home from my 12 hour work day and sit in my sofa and read a paper. Yeah. I, you know, like Christ, we're supposed to lay down our lives for our families like mm -hmm. Christ did. And, and, and a lot of guys I know they're not yeah. willing to do that. Yeah. You know, they got I got softball tonight, honey, or right. You know, and you know, I just I had different um values or, or, yep. or priorities at that time. Yeah. That was important to me. 
Um, and it might not be for other people. Um, but, and then also kind of creating, you know, but that's a big one. I, I'll, uh, I would shoot every, or steer everybody towards uh, Danny Silk. I don't know if you're familiar with like the Bethel, yeah. Bethel ministry, Bethel uh, yeah. in Reading. Um, there's a, Silk. yeah, Danny Silk, he has, so he, he's kind of an expert in relationships. And so he has stuff on marriage stuff, but he has stuff on kids. And he has one called um, raising, raising Your Kids on Purpose or something like that. Okay, and yeah. It, it's, it's probably the best book um, for kids. Um, yeah. A lot of times we're only given one tool from our parents and that's the hammer. You know, I'm going to spank mm -hmm. you or hit you. And I yeah. try to get away from that as soon as possible and connect yeah. with their heart like God does with us. And so that's, it's, yeah. a it's based off a Christian book. This guy uh, did a lot of work with foster kids where they couldn't spank. So that yeah. kind of helped him. Oh, you know what? Actually spanking, you know, it, it, it might not communicate the love of God or whatever. And right. he, had to, he had to figure out, well, what can we do? And mm -hmm. so it, he gets into that. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, yeah. it's, it's, you know, like helping your kids, um, pick up their toys, you know, make as much mess as you want, but before we do anything else, we pick up our toys. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very easy to just, Oh, we're in a hurry. Let me do it for you real quick. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. Um, but he has gobs and gobs of examples. I would definitely, um, yeah. look that up for it. So big time. Uh -huh. That's good, man. Thank you for that. It just sounds like, yeah, the work, the hard work on the front end definitely has this payoff on the back end if we're willing to do it yeah. and be consistent in it. Yeah. Especially keeping their heart. Um, one, yeah. of my, one of my uh, mentors, and I'm not going to let you get this focused on me too much. Because <laughs> I, can, I can talk forever, right? Um, I love it, man. It's fun. Like I said, I enjoy the conversation and no, Nobody we're gonna wants to hear Dave Hogg for an hour. So yeah, I, 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 mean, I love hearing parenting advice, you know, we're, you can, we're learning. Um, yeah, you can definitely come back. We can finish your story or whatever. Um, <laughs> but I, I had the, the pleasure and, and the honor of uh, being connected to a guy named Lou Engel for a long, long time. Yeah. And he had like six kids at the time. And, but he kind of broke that idea. He told me, Nick, you never have to lose your children's heart, you know, keep mm -hmm. your heart, keep that relationship. And this was different wording than Danny Silk had, but eventually Danny Silk's really good at like really fleshing that out. Yeah. But, but Lou Engel told me, don't believe what everyone says that you're going to be able to, you're going to have rebellious teenagers. Um, I've never had a rebellious teenager. I've got five of them. So I, I try to be careful because who knows, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't get too cocky. Yeah. Yeah. But so far, so good. Um, but just guys like that were like breaking that mentality. We, we, like you hear, hear parents talk about their kids as little monsters or, yeah. or that troublemaker. Like we say it in a nice, oh, troublemaker. But what are we really telling them? What are, you know, just being aware yeah. of that stuff. And so getting around good mentorship, getting around the people who have awesome families and stuff and watching and asking questions, of course. Yeah. Um, it's definitely important. So yeah, big time. Oh, that's good, man. That's good. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, what you're saying reminds me of, I just heard this recently and I thought, man, I never thought of that before, but it's kind of like the progression of, of God through his revelation of his character from Genesis to where we are now, yeah. you see God start almost more strict in his parenting, like more, a lot of rules. God, God takes his people, he redeems them out from Egypt, takes them into the wilderness for 40 years to kind of shape them of, you will be my people, I will be your God, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. And I mean, how many chapters, I mean, 20 chapters um in exodus and then how many like all of them in leviticus are all about how the temple should be built like every little detail of the blueprint and how sacrifices should be done and how the priest should be ordained and, and it's all about how to approach god in your relationship with god and then you see god basically just through details and structure and that training 
eventually moving us towards just the freedom we have in Christ to approach him as, as father. As, as, and he's always been that. We've always had the freedom to approach him that way um, through faith. Um, but it's through kind of the early years of structure um, that we then appreciate the freedom of approaching our God as father. And so, yeah, I, I hear you there. Like we got a lot of work to do with our kiddos, but it's fun. We're having a blast. Yeah. And, and that's the biggest thing is to have fun with it. But I mean, yeah. you know, it, it, when you, when you learn how to have that, um, the structure creates, creates freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you, it, it's, you know, we can, yeah, we can definitely start teaching them about that. But let, me get back, <laughs> let me get back to you, sir. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, real quick. So I love oh, that. God. Because that's actually like, uh, <laughs> you know how like you hear all these analogies and you're like, I know that'll be a talk or a sermon one day. I'm just not sure how to connect all the dots yet. I know there's a sermon coming about how structure creates freedom, right? Because even in COVID-19, you see the more restrictions there were, the more creative people were. I had a buddy months before that, I was, we were walking and talking and he, he was a music major, really good at music. He said he had a professor in college who like chained him to a metronome, you know, you gotta follow that metronome and he hated it. But the professor said, if, if, you ch if you chain yourself to the metronome, eventually it will set you free. So like if, if, if you follow that structure as an early musician and, and like the timing of the metronome is just ingrained in you and it becomes your heartbeat, all kinds of freedom will come from that. So like the structure creates freedom. The, yeah, anyway, so anyway, I, there, that's a sermon waiting to happen. I just haven't formulated it yet. So anyway, that's, we can talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> now you got me wanting to talk about this. <laughs> I know, because it sounds like you've got some more dots that could be connected there. Um, yeah. So it, it was a big lesson for me, um, yeah. because uh, one of the biggest times I learned that was I was really, I've never been musical, um, but I've always been in music ministry. And yeah. so I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of the IHOP um kc um yeah mm -hmm. and the house of prayer yeah um so so i was the like the director of the central valley part of that ministry for oh, years, wow. and years okay and, and so before that though learning how to do the harp and bowl harp and bowl um method model of worship is very structured okay. and when i learned it i hated it because <laughs> I was all about, I was coming into this um, understanding of the freedom of God and, and flowing with worship and, and just kind of going back and forth and going wherever the Holy Spirit would lead you or whatever. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> out on the waters, obviously. Yeah, just on the out ocean. there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, I went to um, like a teaching on this to learn the harp and bowl model. And I wasn't too excited about it. I uh -huh. hated it. I didn't know I would end up kind of leading that movement here in California. And they would basically get the Bible. Let me have my, my prop here. Yeah. They would open it up and you start in Psalms. Uh, this is 72, 18. It says, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things and then they would sing that verse word for word though yeah and and that was like the structure and, and i was like why what are you, you know why are you doing that and then they would go to the next verse and they would sing that they would take turns singing that verse back and it was very structured and then i was like well what the heck <laughs> and so he he said um nick you can be all spontaneous if you're doing worship for like an hour, half an hour, two hours, maybe we, we want a ministry. Now this is back in like 98. Yeah. We want a ministry that goes 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they've been going since then. You have to have that structure somewhere to land to take off again. When, when the spontaneity yeah. stops, where are you going to land? And that's yeah. why we, we have the scripture. And so it was like, oh, okay, I get it. 
And the more I did it, that structure created way more freedom mm. than I, I could ever imagine. And, and just the fun times flowing back and forth with spontaneous song and stuff like that. So anyways, like I hated it at first. I, yeah. I left that night swearing we are never going to do this ever. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and there's that, I was very young. I was like 18, 17. So it was yeah. maturity I didn't understand. And um, so, yeah. you know, kids, kids needs, we all need the structure. And the more we learn to be disciplined and stuff that creates that spontaneity where we can be creative, like you were talking about. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, anyways, you look, you can look in the universe, you have all these yeah. rules, right? Yeah. But then you have all these crazy spontaneity, you know, the sunset's never the same every night, the stars yeah. shooting all over the place. So, yeah. yeah yeah there is something there that's that's good that's a great example of it of yeah like the structure the patterns are set in place like and god is is as very clearly woven those into his creation from the beginning and those don't change like though you don't go against the grain of those patterns god's put in place and yet he's created all kinds of freedom from those patterns yeah so yeah. Oh, that's good. I love it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's yeah. A... And by the way, Psalms, I, I just think, man, I, I'm still waiting for somebody to get really good at singing, like putting melodies to the Psalms word for word. There, there's a few bands out there that have tinkered with it, but it's hard to, because I love just straight singing scripture. I want that in my mind, in my heart. It's hard to find there's a lot of Psalms out there, but people have done kind of a, not a great job with it. Yeah, I don't, I, I wish I could uh, transport you back to like 98, 99, because uh -huh. that's what they did. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was great. Um, I, for me personally, the, because it became a, a place where thousands and thousands of people would come and, and get trained up and the, the founders kind of went off and, and started other stuff. I think it hasn't kind of stayed the quality that it used to be. But, yeah. I mean, it was, it was. It was really good times. There's some old, old before like YouTube stuff. So I, I don't even know if I could find it, but yeah. um, I'll, I'll send you something if I find it. See if you Please like do. it. I do. Cause I do. I, I, uh, I try and memorize and meditate a, on a lot of Psalms because man, they speak to me in all kinds of seasons. And it's like, that's what I want in my mind and my heart. I love music. I love all kinds of music, but I find that, man, I need, I need that truth right there on the front of my mind. Um, otherwise, my thinking goes all over. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, basically for years and years and years, that's all I did was sing the Bible, like sing yeah. the scripture. And I mean, I've got, I've got, uh, I can, I can relive experience. You know how you can yeah. memorize songs way easier and stuff. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I can, geez, you know, that's going back like 20 years. You know, I, I can hear it in my head, like. Uh, there's one chorus that I just love. It's so simple, but it's on that, those scriptures, you know, you are my rock, you are my rock, and I will trust you. I will trust yeah. you. And they just start singing it over and over. They create like a chorus where everyone can join in, but then after mm -hmm. a while, they'll go off, you, you know, and they'll change it up, and then they'll come back, and it just builds, and it, when it's done, it's, it's, it's beautiful, it's powerful, yeah. Yeah, that's good. You, uh, I mean, yeah, that's it. what. Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. What were you? I was just gonna say. I mean, I tell our worship leaders that all the time. I said I'm not self-deprecating here, but the reality is, I can teach a 30-minute sermon or 45-minute sermon, whatever. Try and stick around 30. I pour my heart into that thing, and I hope and I trust the Holy Spirit takes it and moves in people's minds and hearts, and I have to leave it there. The reality is. I mean, statistically speaking, what is it like? There's maybe a 6%, maybe 14% retaining rate of like verbal communication. So like by the time people get to their car in the parking lot or to lunch <laughs> Sunday afternoon, they've forgotten 94% of what I just taught on in the word. And yet people will tell me when they're going through a tough time, they have this lyric going through their mind and their heart and 
And man, I'm so glad we sang that song on Sunday because man, Friday I was getting beat up at work and I, but I had that song we sang on and I'm like, five days later, you still have the song here? I bet you can't tell me a dang thing I said in my sermon, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I tell our worship leader all the time, what we sing matters. It's, it's not just about, was there a moment or environment created, but like, are we singing truth? Because that truth will embed in people's minds and hearts. I think even longer than a, a good sermon will. There's just something about music. Yes. Something about, yeah. yeah. It's interesting to, to hear a pastor say that. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah, somebody's got to figure out a way to put sermons to song, I guess, and then you, well, you, got, the, you got it. No, you, yeah. um, so so there is there's this I can nerd out about all this uh, underground like worship stuff right <laughs> yeah. um, so so there was a you know man I don't even know what to call it but there was a movement in some worship leaders there was a guy named uh, Benjamin Dunn uh, okay. back in the day who he would teach through through his songs he was very you know much more than what normal worship songs or whatever, but there's this idea of teaching about the love of God or this is, but yeah. there is, um, there is that going on. And I, I've, you know, I haven't been in that world as much recently. Yeah. So I, I'm curious, but it, you're not gonna, honestly, you're not gonna hear a lot of it on the radio or whatever. A right. lot of this is just, you know, a local worship leader that really gets into doing that. Um, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to, I, I've definitely worked with a lot of worship leaders in the future. I, I'm, I'm ex passionate about doing that. So it'll be cool. Yeah. Tell me, I, I didn't even get to ask you, what are you doing right now? Uh, you know, you mentioned working with a lot of leaders and so forth, but yeah, what, what's that look like for you? Um, so right now, so I, I was in um, kind of ministry all throughout up until about probably like four or five years ago was the last kind of church plant or church anything yeah. that I did. Um, yeah. When I got divorced with my kid's mom, I was kind of for the first time able to pursue what I was passionate about. And at that time it was going and helping, going into the darkest places of the city, basically yeah. going into the bars, the clubs, the strip clubs, the motorcycle gang places, the, you know, over in Bulldog Lane where it's horrible. Um, yeah. But going into the darkest places and, and, and shining the light, the love of God to these people. And, yeah. um, you know, we had, so I started, I wanted to, most of those people could not walk into most churches on Sunday morning and feel comfortable. Yeah. Right? And, and that's okay. You know, that's, that's not, horrible you're not going to fit in everywhere so right my passion was to create these fellowships for those people so someone who wants to have a beer and talk about god i started a fellowship at um these different bars so we could do that yeah um, i at the time i had never even sipped uh alcohol yeah. and tried it yeah <laughs> um so i started that stuff i went and did uh i started a weed church i had never smoked weed before i wasn't a weed guy wow. but it wasn't about me anytime i wanted i like what you said earlier anytime that i started a church or fellowship i wanted to kind of replace myself as soon as possible yeah um, i didn't want it to be about me or my personality um but i started you know like and, and these are cultures that maybe i don't even agree with um mm -hmm. maybe i would consider them being wrong but yeah wanted them to be able to have a place to pursue God, to pursue that, that relationship. Um, I started homosexual uh, churches way before they were popular. Um, yeah. <laughs> transgender um, ministry and, and, and stuff like that. Um, all kinds. And that's what I was passionate about. And for the first time, I was able to kind of almost lose my reputation as a minister. Because when you go out and you do that, you, you, you kind of like Jesus, you hang out with prostitutes and, and yeah. drunkards and, you know, everybody started, it, it happened. You know, everybody started saying I was a drunkard. I was a club hopper. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was sleeping with prostitutes and all that. None of it was true. 
<laughs> right. But that's, you know, I had all these ministers come and say, hey, you know what? You'll never be able to preach in any of these churches ever again if you do this. Yeah. And I said, I I'm okay with that. You, you guys have your pastors. There's all, there's wells everywhere. In <laughs> Fresno and everywhere. Um, and I think that's awesome. Yeah. But, but for me, it was like, you guys don't need me in these regular churches. I want to go out there in, in these mm -hmm. other places and help them. So, so anyways, I was passionate and I started, I got away from the regular church or small home groups or whatever and did that. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of had a season of my life. My best friend died. He was kind of my mm -hmm. associate pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, he died young with cancer. Um, mm -hmm. And that hit me really hard. Um, I wanted, I, I, you know, just got into, I got into another relationship, got married for a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. it kind of had, um, you know, separated from her and got another divorce and, yeah. and just kind of going through that time. Um, I wanted to start my own business. I never felt like I would ever be able to be, a, be in ministry ever again. I just, I don't know if there was a place for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got into business, started different businesses. And so that's kind of what I'm doing right now. But um, Jay Baker, I was talking to him, so I, all his sayings are in my mind. But he said that he's haunted by Christianity. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's a, it was a weird wording. But I kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. too, is like, I'm, I'm haunted. I, I, my passion, my desire, my first ministry is to my kids and my family. And, and so I hope that they are walking around out there you know, throwing out love and joy and peace because they've experienced that through myself and, and stuff, but I still have so much. And so mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I kind of just, that's a passion inside of me that won't go away. Um, yeah. and so I'm, I work in entrepreneurial vetting. So I do a lot of interviewing for wealthy families, finding people to collaborate with and do that. Yeah. Um, I feel like to do my ministry that I want to do, I'm going to have to finance it myself yeah mm -hmm. um, and, and that's fine um but then god i actually talking to my brother he was like dude what what can you do now though I said, yeah you know and so i started thinking so i was like yeah i can i can help i can i have this ability to 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 do the media stuff and, and get that going i can i can be a blessing to the the pastors and ministers and network and and, and do all that i can do that now right um, so that's kind of what led me here to do it yeah so here we are man. i love it what can i do right now yeah, yeah. I, mean, I know god is building me and growing me and moving me towards something but what is it right now i can be faithful to so that's good man i love it i yeah. love it yeah. yeah well why don't we end with uh tell us a little bit about your garden tell us at least one <laughs> thing about yourself <laughs> oh i don't know <laughs> so you know what's funny is uh yeah, I told you about Tom, one of the salesmen here, and then obviously your brother Jason. Well, uh, we're always talking out here out front, and the kids are playing. And so one day we were talking with Tom and, and Jason out front here, and, and I said, well, why don't you come on back and, and see what we've done? And Tom, uh, he lives up in Core School, and he loves working outdoors. He's got a lot of stuff. He, so we talk a lot about gardening and stuff. So he walked back there, and he loved it. He's like, man, you guys, because um, we've got kind of a – uh, trellis with some grapevines that we're growing and then uh, another trellis for boysenberries and then a couple raised garden beds and then we planted about six uh, different varieties of fruit trees and um, I, being a baseball guy I love um, like I love um, just like a nice lawn there's something about it to me so I, I really uh, really looked into it, did my research, and wanted to do a Bermuda hybrid that would just, like, I could cut short and would look good and kind of feel good. And so grass is, like, important to me. Uh, and so, anyway, so Tom walks back there, and he loves it. He's like, this, is, you guys have done such a good job. Jason looks at us, and he's like, this looks horrible. <laughs> and he's all this would be horrible to me but this seems good for you guys yeah. <laughs> and I love Jason's honesty he was like oh I would hate this yeah but I'm so glad that you guys like this <laughs> yeah. we, uh, neither one of us are kind of like green thumbs or outside yeah. anything um, yeah. but my my girlfriend is uh Laotian and so okay that, yeah 
that community, they, they all have gardens and they'll share a plot of, you know, land and build a garden. Uh, so her mom, you know, has a, a garden behind her house and, and her mom's got like three, four, five different gardens all over the place. And That's so he, cool. he kind of asked me, that, uh, is it weird that someone has a, a, a whole garden in their, you know, I think he said front yard, but it's in the okay. backyard. Yeah, it's our backyard. We're thinking but, about the front just for the community aspect of yeah. it. Uh, there isn't a homeowners association here, so we wouldn't get in trouble, but we also don't want to be like those neighbors. So yeah. we're developing good relationships with our neighbors and, and they actually started planting some fruit trees and stuff. So we might swap varieties, which is cool. Really great neighbors. So we would like to do something in our front yard because I think that's where the relationship and the community happens yeah. um, eventually. But yeah, so your brother asked you about that already. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was like, at first I was like, it's, it's kind of normal because of the culture. Yeah. Um, but then I was like, okay, I get what you're, it's a big deal for you. Uh, he's like, yeah. got to ask him about the garden. So <laughs> but I, I, I see people starting to do it in their front yard all over the place. And yeah. like, um, I've been in some pretty nice neighborhoods um, with a front yard, but they don't have a, a yard or lawn. It's, it's a yeah. garden. They're doing it. Yeah. So kind of a, a I love cool, it. That's one of our desires, you know, for, for my wife and I um, is one of our kind of prayers since we were married, you know, we rented for, you know, the first almost eight years of our marriage and this first uh, home we've owned, but every place we've rented or now owned, our prayer has been um, just the, the fruit of the spirit that, that uh, we love having people over for dinner. We love doing counseling with people so we have a lot of people in our home and one of our constant prayers is that um, no matter who walks into our home a neighbor a friend or somebody in the church um, they would feel like they got to almost taste of the fruit of the spirit just yes. by being in our home awesome. um, through the way we treat each other and love our kids the conversation we have the joy that's there I want people walking out of there like Man, I feel like love, joy, peace, patience is like tangible, you know? Yeah, it is. And so part of the garden, if you want to tell your brother, I could tell too. Part of the, the reason for the garden is we want when people come over to feel that, uh, both physically and spiritually, to feel like uh, it's a little bit of a step back towards, step forward, I would say, towards the Garden of Eden or ultimately the new heavens and the new earth. So that's one of our prayers is, um, so I would love the front yard to kind of mark that too. Like you come in through the front into our home backyard, like you feel like, uh, uh, this is a little taste of what, uh, being in the presence of Jesus is going to be like, you know? So that's just our, our little prayer we've had for about eight years. So I like I, it. I like yeah. it. I, I love, <laughs> I've really enjoyed talking to you, Dave. Um, yeah. you, we went different places than I, <laughs> um, but I, I mean, there's a lot that you said that is a huge encouragement to me. Mm -hmm. I, I love to hear from a pastor when they have the, that type of a heart. Um, yeah. So I definitely want to stay connected. And are, are you doing the Saturday night thing already? Is that begun? We're going to start the first uh, Saturday of September. So I think it's September 6th and we'll just do it four Saturdays in a row. Um, so seriously, come on out 630. Um, come hang out in our backyard and uh, you can bring Jason and make fun of our garden too. And <laughs> <laughs> bring the kids and everything. Yeah, that'd be yeah, fun. Totally. And uh, yeah, we're gonna let the kids run around and bring your own lawn chair and we're gonna okay. kick it campfire style. I yeah, like it, man. Yeah, so come on out any of those nights, and uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a good time. So, well, uh, where can people connect with you? Um, how do they find you? Yeah, so uh, online, you know, just the wellmadera.com. Um, you'll see my contact on there. Um, and so actually we, we ended up putting uh, some of our phone numbers as leaders up on the website because we just felt like it's so hard to connect with people in person right now, but people need relationship more than ever. So give us yeah. a call, give us a text. Um, we want to be more available than ever. So yeah, you can literally find my phone number on the website, um, Instagram, Facebook, you name it. Uh, just, yeah, come find me, come talk to me and, uh, 
you can come pick a couple figs in the backyard. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I'll, I'll put all that information in the description. And uh, good luck to you guys finding out anything about Dave is going to turn it back on you. So be prepared. <laughs> all right, brother. Yeah. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it, man. Nick, so you. enjoyed the time with you. Thank you. All right, brother. We'll see you guys next time.